Great, good afternoon. Uh, we're delighted to be joined by WFP's Executive Director, uh, David Beasley, who's just come back from Yemen and who will brief the Security Council in a couple of hours, but we thought it would be good to have him here, come here first. It's good to be here. You mean rock and roll? Yeah, let's go. All right. Well, it's good morning. And uh, to be able to walk here this morning after yesterday, to be able to get in yesterday was a miracle. A lot of people didn't get in last night that was we were supposed to meet with today, but I just flew back literally yesterday from Yemen, and uh, I could just tell you, it's not good. Well, I spent a day in Hadeda. I spent uh, a couple of days in Aden and Sana'a and that surrounding region, and the numbers that we you're familiar with, we're supporting about 8 million people now. And we expect with the new numbers come out in about uh, two weeks that we very well may need and probably will need to ramp up to somewhere between 12 to 14 million people. We anticipate the numbers now are about approximately, not anticipate, the numbers now are about 18 million people are food insecure. And the number I'm talking about, 8 million up to 12 to 14, are severely food insecure. These are people literally marching uh, toward the brink of starvation. Now, let me go from numbers down to people, because this is the heartbreak. Uh, as I was in the hospital, I couldn't get access to the hospital, and no one can in Hadeda. But I did make it to see the situation in the hospital in and Sana'a, which was filled with a lot of children from Hadeda and surrounding areas. In fact, one little boy, Muhammad, uh, Muhammad Mahassan, he was about eight months old, weighed 3.3 kilograms, should be weighing about nine kilograms, a child of eight months age. So he's one third the weight. And this little boy, his mother had driven 300 kilometers, hours upon hours, going through all the checkpoints, all the dangers, getting into the hospital, and the little boy died yesterday. One little child, I remember his little feet was sticking out the blanket and, you know, it was kind of cute. And I went and tickled the little feet, you know, thinking I'd get a little smile and just like tickling a ghost. And nothing there. And I went from room to room from malnutrition based upon uh, whether it was chronic diarrhea, acute diarrhea, from lack of food, lack of immune systems because of lack of food, lack of good water, and the list goes on. I was talking to the doctor and I said, what's your capacity now of handling children in this medical state? He said, we have the capacity to handle 20, only 20 children. I said, well, how many children are being brought in on a daily basis. He said, every day, about 50 children are brought to us. We have to send 30 home to die. We can only accommodate 20. The sad news is this is not an isolated dynamic here. This is the norm in a country that is struggling, that is suffering. These are families and mothers and children with names and so several things, I'll be talking about several things this afternoon, but first and foremost, the food security situation is deteriorating. The economic conditions are deteriorating. And that is going to compound the humanitarian situation in such a way that if, if there's not economic liquidity immediately put into the economy, I don't think there's ever going to be enough humanitarian support for us to address the collapse that's taking place. This is not on the brink of a catastrophe. This is a catastrophe as we speak. I, we'll talk more about this later today, but what you have is a perfect storm taking place. You've got a collapse of the, the real. You've got food prices now skyrocketing. You've got people with hardly any cash at all because there are no jobs 
Eight million people have lost their livelihoods. 1.2 civil servants have been paid nominal amounts of money in the past two years. And that 1.2 million civil servants, they support about, on average, six people per household. So that's about eight million right there. And so it's a drastic situation. We anticipate that $400, $200 million is needed to be injected into the economy to stabilize the economic collapse. If, in fact, we find the numbers that we anticipate coming out in the next two weeks, from 8 million to 12 or 14 million, we will need from a, we now presently spend about $100 million per month on food security and commodities, food, et cetera, and our efforts on the ground inside Yemen. If we have to scale up to a 12 to 14, we will need about $150 million. And what we're hoping, if we can convince the Houthis and others, the government, the official government, has already given us authorization for biometrics so we can put in place uh, the protocols that we need to do cash-based transfers. Uh, if we scale up to $150 million, assuming we can get the money that we need, what we would like to do is inject out of that $150, $50 million of that will be in liquidity in terms of cash-based transfers. And that will go a long way in addressing the $200 million that's needed per month to stop the real from collapsing any further. In fact, we believe that will stabilize it and move it uh, to a value that will allow the economy uh, to begin to prime the pump again. And so we'll be speaking about that today to the Security Council, what's going to be needed uh, in addition to uh, food security, economic collapse, and then what will we need uh, as humanitarians, greater access to different places. Uh, one of the problems we continue to struggle with, the last year, if you remember, I was pretty hard on the Saudis because of the blockade uh, and lack of financial support. Uh, we worked through that, but we are continuing to have difficulties out in the field uh, with the Houthis in terms of access, visas for people. We still have about 20 visas that have not been approved, which is critical when you're feeding uh, 8 million people. You've got to have the team in place, the structure in place. You can't just put anybody. And we don't want any outsiders or anyone telling us who we need to hire. We need to have the right teams in place. And so we continue to struggle with access monitoring, the people we need, the visas, the equipment that we need, uh, fuel. Uh, we, as you know, we are the logistics cluster for the UN systems of operations, for whether it's UNICEF, WHO, whatever. And, uh, in fact, we had 4 million liters that was in kind contribution made available to us and because of the denial and the slowness, the complications dealing with uh, the Houthis, we lost it. It's just these types of impediments that we continue to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So going forward, uh, the meetings that we had in the last three, well, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, uh, with the Houthi leadership, with the government, with the donors, uh, everyone's saying the right things right now, but, but I've heard that before by some of those on the ground. Uh, let's just hope that improves because uh, while famine may not have been declared at this stage, we've been able to avert famine, but that doesn't mean the rate of starvation and hunger has not substantially increased. It has. Nothing but the grace of God that we're not in complete famine. But after you declare a famine, it's too late, so to speak. How many children are dying now? Anyway, let me just kind of stop there and answer any questions uh, they may have. And sure. Edie? Yeah, the legend. I always. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Beasley, thank you very much. Edith Lettera from the Associated Press. Um, you just brought up the question of famine, and of course, um, so far it's been averted, but um, the picture you paint is pretty dire, and it seems like it's going to require um, a significant amount of money and uh, people to 
actually avert a f avert famine. Um, how worried are you that this money isn't going to come in, and when could this go over the brink? How soon, if soon? It, it is my opinion that this stage now, notwithstanding, we're waiting for the final numbers to come out. We anticipate some of the numbers we've already seen just in the last few months. The number, I think, in the last three months, 3.6 million people have gone from being food secure to being severely food insecure just in the last three months. In the last month, it's over one million. Now, the question you've got to ask yourself, what's the dynamic change in the last few months compared to a year ago? Because many factors are still the same. You've got a war, you've got conflict. Our access issues are just as difficult today that were yesterday. We're feeding more people, and this is extremely important. You cannot solve the humanitarian crisis in Yemen today with humanitarian response alone. It's now going to require an economic infusion of substantial uh, liquidity. Both are going to be required to avert a famine. It cannot be just one. It's going to require a complete package, and we'll talk about that later today in more details. But it's going to require a minimum of two dynamics, pillars to, in my opinion, to avert famine. One, of course, is more humanitarian aid for those who we can get access to, which I do believe that we can get access to the most of the population in the country, notwithstanding some pockets. But the second is liquidity. And it is equally, in my opinion, if not more important, what the war has done in a few years, the collapse of the economy will do in a few months. I, you must forgive me, I forgot to welcome you on behalf of the United Nations Correspondents Association. Thank you for coming so soon after your trip and doing this briefing. Pam. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Executive hey, Director Pam. Pam, Pam Falk from CBS News. Uh, with the fighting near Hodeida, how has that affected the transport of aid yeah. for you? And you just you were there one year ago. How do you see the difference? And one little follow up, which is yeah. you said things we've worked things out with the Saudis. Um, can you explain that? Well, what we worked out with the Saudis a year ago was two things. One, because I was being pretty hard on the Saudis, if you recall. Of course, the Houthis liked it when I was hard on the Saudis. And I told the Houthis, I said, I'll be just as hard on you if you cross the line. And I, with the Saudis, we felt like there were two dynamics, uh, uh, you know, get aside from the political question of the war itself. First was the blockade, so we worked through that. Uh, and we're still issues of moving containers through inspections, and we can talk about that. The second was, this is a war that you're engaged in. You're a wealthy nation. You need to be paying for the humanitarian consequence. You shouldn't be leaving it just to the West to do that, like the United States and like Germany and the UK. Uh, there are plenty of other places in the world. So the Saudis have improved in that regard, but we still ha have, uh, with the Saudis, we still have to work through issues uh, on an ongoing basis uh, because most in, in, in Yemen, 90% of the food comes from the outside. And the port Hadeda, I don't know what the exact number, 70, 80% of of uh, Yemen's supplies come through that port. So a lot of commodities, a lot of containers, all the containers have been moved down to Aden. And so this creates complications. There were four kilometers of ships backed up because they don't have the equipment necessary to do the type X-ray scanning so we can move the cargo along. We're pushing for uh, more equipment, more supplies there. You Literally, when I was there uh, Monday, when I flew in Monday, the number of trucks backed up because the trucks, uh, the c container ships come in, unload, then they own the truck. Well, the trucks have to each individually be inspected. I forgot, 4,000 trucks maybe? Guys, it was about 4,000 trucks we saw sitting. Does that sound about right? I can't remember. Anyway, Pam, problems. Uh, but we work through them, but if these types of delays create issues. These impediments are, are causing people, in my opinion, to unnecessarily suffer. Uh, the UAE, 
I, I just went to UAE and met with the leadership there. And over the past year, I, I can honestly say that uh, the UAE has been everything we've asked of them. Uh, they actually at, call us and say, "What is there anything we're not doing right? Is there anything we can further do? It's been a substantial improved relationship, quite frankly. The Houthis, is, is, depends on which Houthi group you're talking with. I mean, it really does. One part of the Houthis, we work together very effectively, and there's another part of the Houthis that we continue to have problems day in and day out. But we're continuing to press along. Uh, when I was there uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, meeting with the different Houthi leaders, the de facto government, the, uh, the official government, expressing our concerns, expressing our needs, expressing our problems, and we articulated each and every one and went through them. Uh, the response, as it was last time, was very good, but sometimes the, the response to me is much better than the response or the follow-through. But uh, I, I'm hopeful. I, I really am hopeful. Can but, you stick with then and now, a year ago for you and now? High data is a whole different ball game. The, the, instru the suffering in high data uh, last year was was terrible, but this year, walking, driving into Hidata is not so simple. I mean, what was normally a three, four hour, five hour drive was was now uh, almost double that uh, because of the checkpoints and because you're having to do diversion routes around the front line. The front line is constantly moving, and I think about 17 to 19 different locations in the country. And because of that, we're having to move commodities and food supplies and warehousing on a constant basis. Uh, in that regard, the, the UAE has been extremely positive to work with. The Houthis continue to give us trouble because they don't want us moving supplies across the lines into non-Houthi controlled areas. And we, we, we like, well, we're neutral. We, we support all the innocent people in this country. We don't care who they are. But when I was in Hadeda two days ago, three days ago, Parts of Hadeda were like a ghost town. No people. It's like in an eerie movie where a town has been completely deserted. The only thing I saw were dogs walking the streets. What we've done in Hadeda is because it's unsafe for people to walk the streets in the areas beyond the, on the Houthi side controlled area inside the city. So what we've done is, is on the food basket, so to speak, and general food distribution, we give them enough food to last for one month. That way they only have to come to us once. They put their life on the line once as to us. And so we maximize what we can give them so it minimizes their risk of entering into the streets, into these combat areas. Now, having said that, uh, the Houthis have been, uh, in the last couple of months especially, and I've condemned them to the highest degree, and I brought this up with them every meeting I had this week was they've been entering some of their soldiers, militants have been entering into our warehouse and facilities and using them as safe havens, violating the most fundamental humanitarian principles on earth. They have been uh, going on facilities like the silos for sniping, uh, for snipers on top of some of these facilities, entering our warehouses for safety, and they're also putting their equipment beside our warehouses and buildings because they know that they won't get struck. So we've asked them to stop that. We'll see. Thank you. James and Ali. James Bays from Al Jazeera English. Um, first, a follow up to Edie's question, which is in terms of uh, what you call phase five of famine. In a worst case scenario, how long are we talking that we could reach that? And then my question is, you are a very senior UN official. You happen to be one of the most senior US um, um, citizens who serves in a, in a UN post. Never and would clearly, have thought that five years and, and, ago. And, 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 cle <laughs> and clearly the US has a very important role in terms of funding, in terms yeah. of the voice of things. Um, what more does the US need to do, because this has been called a forgotten, neglected conflict. What more do you want to hear from the administration, from the US media? Because if you walk the streets here in New York, many people wouldn't even have heard there was a crisis in Yemen. Yeah. Uh, Arif, let me, I got my economist. There's a reason I brought our, our economist here. But based on the economic conditions today, if they continue to deteriorate like they are, regardless of our humanitarian relief efforts, what would be a reasonable expectation 
of, of famine, of true famine conditions. A few months. About six months. Now that's assuming you know, we can still maintain the level, if not increase, in humanitarian support. Even with that, I think we will be in famine conditions uh, because of the economic collapse. That's why it must require both. Now, as to the United States, I think everyone's concerned all over the world about every continent seems to have some political division taking place, whether it's Europe or the UK or South America, and the United States is no different. <laughs> Just look at the elections. Uh, it's been interesting uh, since I've took this role, uh, and I've been traveling to Washington frequently, taking advantage, honestly, of every relationship that I have politically ever had. Uh, it seems like the only thing the Republicans and Democrats are agreeing on nowadays is is food aid <laughs> on international aid. It's been remarkable. Our support from the United States, because I have been very clear that it's in the United States national security interest and it's a, it's a better investment to address the root cause of issues as opposed to post-conflict. It's a lot cheaper and it's better for, the, for the, the communities involved and impacted, whether it's Sahel or it doesn't matter, wherever. Uh, our funding, the World Food Program, and I've advocated for other uh, agencies as well, uh, especially some of the ones that we work with on a daily basis like UNICEF or WHO, whatever the case may be. But our funding uh, was at point, a little bit or around $1.89 billion when I arrived. Uh, last year, our funding from the United States government was $2.5 billion. This year, I anticipate it being between two point five and $2.5 well, maybe three billion, but somewhere in that neighborhood depends on allocations in the last six, 60 days, last 45 days. Uh, so we've been able to make tremendous progress in the United States. And the message I keep getting from the White House and from our Republican and Democrat colleagues working together in the United States Senate, the United States House, is now you go tell our friends around the world and especially our European friends that we're not backing down on international aid. Now you step up too. I say that because I've made that case to the Bundestag and the members of the parliament in the UK. The Bundestag, uh, the German government, has increased their funding from what was six years ago, $65 million a year, to when I got there about $600 million, and now they're at $1 billion. Uh, this year I think it's one, about $1 billion. Uh, the EU is being constant somewhere between 600 and 800 million on average or a billion, but it have to average it out how they do their bookkeeping. Uh, the UK has stepped up between now, it was 400 million when I arrived now, it's about 600 million. Uh, and so many of the traditional donors are stepping up, understanding that if they, this is the argument that I've been making, if you allow us to come in and address the root cause, it's a lot cheaper. The, for example, the the support of Syrian in, in Damascus about 50 cents per meal. That same Syrian in Berlin's 50 euros a day in total humanitarian support. Uh, and I just came back from Syria, by the way. <laughs> That's a whole other series of questions. But uh, so the United States has really made uh, made good. I've been I've been proud of the United States, uh, but it's not it's an ongoing uh, matter. Uh, you, you can't make any assumptions nowadays, so we're all hands on deck at all the time. Uh, inside the White House, I feel very confident of the support that we have. Uh, inside the U.S. Senate and U.S. House, I feel very confident, but there are constant uh, concerns that, that we need to stay on top of. I'll leave it at that. And so <laughs> Ali? Thank you, sir. My name is Ali Barada. I work for Ashak al Ossat newspaper and France 24. My question is, uh, were you able uh, to identify where are the areas that endanger most in, uh, regarding famine and, uh, and whether you've been able to uh, reach those areas and uh, I heard also there were some lootings of the aid. Uh, can you please uh, address those issues? This is the biggest complaint we have with the Houthis with regards to access. We need more people on the ground. Uh, this is a struggle every day, literally, inside Yemen. Uh, and we express our concerns. 
And when you're feeding this many people in this type of uh, environment, it's complicated, it's complex, it's dangerous. And so we make it very clear that the donors uh, want to assure that the money goes, the food goes to the places it should. Uh, since, we're imp since we're giving out food, it, it gets to the hands no matter what, but that's not the issue with us. The issue is making sure that every bit of food that we supply out into the communities gets to intended recipients. And this is an ongoing concern that we're dealing with on an ongoing basis. We address it every time this happens. There's a couple, in fact, I was talking this morning, our team, about a couple of the areas. If you would let me maybe later give you two or three areas that we're struggling with and access, not knowing the exact numbers and the concerns. I can't remember off the top of my head. I don't know if it's lack of sleep or old age, but. <laughs> so I'll, I'll get, we got those areas, Arif. I know y'all have. You know, you, you have a microphone next to your... Uh, Arif, you don't mind? Yeah, Arif, you don't mind? Yeah, there's a microphone right there next to your chair. Yeah, so so we have uh, different places. One is Amaran, one is uh, Haja, where we have um, higher levels of food insecurity. But right now, as we speak, there is this IPC uh, assessment which is going on. And the idea behind that assessment is not only to, to, to say with some certainty what is the number of, of severely food insecure people in the country, but also to see where they are. So on the basis of that, then we, we do our uh, design and operation. But like the executive director was saying, the one thing which is really critically important right now is the ability to do the assessments, to go and see our, for ourselves, and to monitor what we are doing to see the impact of the assessment of the, the, the assistance that we are providing. Hi. Joseph Klein, Canada Free Press. You mentioned the importance of uh, infusing liquidity into the economy. Uh, and you mentioned to f help facilitate cash transfers. And if I understood you correctly, you said approximately $200 million monthly? Or, uh, so, yes, okay. monthly, monthly. So my question, my question is, what would be the mechanism to accomplish that in a secure manner? I mean, if the country itself is basically, a, some would call it a failed state, um, divided authority and so forth, uh, which means there's probably no central bank that can um, um, efficiently and safely administer uh, the, you know, the liquidity. How, how, how um, confident are you that if this money is infused into the economy that it will actually accomplish what you hope it will accomplish? Well, these are the issues that the, the international community will have to come around. World Bank, uh, the Central Bank of Yemen, uh, we met with the governor. Uh, of the central bank uh, express these concerns but i think the international community will have to put in the right protocols what will what will be the process but i feel v very confident that that there's a process that can be laid out because with the different banks and the different financial opportunities what we will work through and of course dealing with biometrics is a whole different discussion but to assure that each individual gets the money that needs to be getting them the support because what we want to do is try to obviously, with if we can put 50 million per month into the economy, in other words, moms, and that's primary who does all the buying, we do it through the mothers. The mothers go to a local store that we will set up structurally uh, with the biometrics, with the systems, and so the money will be transferred uh, through the beneficiary, probably using a, a scope card or uh, or whatever the case may be. So as to our side, it will be easy to do. We've been, we do this all over, all over the world. Um, so it could be like a, like a credit card, and then they'll have the biometrics. Most likely it will not be the eye, it might probably be fingerprinting. Uh, we we're actually talking about that right now. We, we now, it's hard to believe, but when you think 10 years ago there was no hard, hardly any cash-based transfer systems, now we're doing almost $2 billion a year in cash-based transfers out of our total budget now of about this year, probably between six and seven billion as we end, end, end the year. So as to the World Food Program, we feel very confident we can integrate 50 some odd million, give or take, uh, without any uh, uh, security or integrity issues. As to the rest of the monies, I feel confident that the UN system working with the international players will be able to put the right 
protocols in process. But that's cool. That has to be worked through. Arif, do you have anything you want to add to that? Is that? Because that won't be our field of expertise. But, so, but w w the reason we're very concerned about it is because we are food security. And we know that we can't address food security through the humanitarian side alone. And so that's why we're so uh, dynamically engaged into this issue of economic liquidity, because that's the only way you're going to have food security across the entire nation, uh, regardless of the humanitarian side, is, is the amount of liquidity it's going to take to stabilize the real and food prices. And so this is why we've engaged on the issue now, to explain to the leaders of the world that you've got to put effectively, strategically, another $200 million. Now, most of that, I, I'm assuming now, can go through, uh, much of that can go through, not most, a lot of that can go through payment for teachers and so, government employees, civil servants, uh, that kind of thing. But, Arif, you yeah. want to yeah, so, add so, to what I just? Yes, sir. So just to put this in, in perspective, the Yemeni real has de depreciated by about 235 percent right. in January 2015. In the last three months, it has depreciated by 45 percent. What, what that means is that for an ordinary Yemeni, the purchasing power is just about a third of what it used to be. At the same time, like you were saying, you know, people have lost about 9 million livelihoods. So that's why it is not necessarily just about the, the, the 8 or 10 or 12 million people which we are going to be assisting. It is about the entire population because it is also not only about food now. It is about fuel. It is about things which are run on that fuel, for example, hospitals, clean water, for example, solid waste treatment. And if we don't take care of these things, uh, that is a total collapse for the economy and, 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 and frankly, a big, uh, almost the entire population of, of Yemen. So taking care of the financial or economic crisis by injecting money into the hands of people is, uh, is something which will not only save, save people's lives through our assistance, but it will uh, help the broader economy. And, and, this, and this gets very technical. When we were talking to the governor of the bank, it's about, for example, you can imagine if a country that requires 90% of all, not just food, but all items come from the outside with the collapse of the real and no cash and debt, who wants to supply anything on the commercial side? And so we're t we, were, we spent quite a bit of time with the governor of the central bank explaining that this is a critical area of particular types of items uh, that need to be prioritized so that the funds can be released so that the, the, the commercial buyers inside Yemen can actually pay for something and stimulate the economy again. Well, this is, these issues are extremely important and we were seeing unintended consequences by some impediments, rules and regulations that they were imposing, not realizing the, the delays that it was causing. So we're working through those, uh, even though, you know, that's not our forte per se, but we, we, nobody moves more supplies in a nation than we do in times of war and conflict. And so we're trying to give our expertise and advice and explaining you're running out of time. And so the response has been, and by and large, pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, they're working on it as we speak. Great. We're going to have time for three quick questions. Maggie, Evelyn, and Iptism. Uh, Mr. Beasley. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, Over yeah. Here. Oh, Hi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Margaret Bashir with The Voice of America. Uh, my question to you is, uh, Mr. Lincoff has put forward five things that he needs from the Security Council. Uh, do those match what you need, or you, do you need anything additional from the Security Council? Uh, uh, a second uh, on the fuel issue, um, the, the uh, government is restricting the fuel imports. So how has that directly impacted WFP's operations? Fuel is a constant problem. Uh, we've made a lot of headway. We're, we've got how, we're on, we're on the, what's the fuel status? We were talking about this yesterday, guys. Are we? Let me get let me let me get I want to get a technical so, answer on this. So, so there was something which is called um, Decree 75, right. which was put in place, 
which was essentially control of six commodities, mostly food commodities plus fuel, and which meant in simple terms was that all the purchases of that had to go through, through the government. Uh, now they've lifted that, which is a positive uh, development, but that, that uh, element on the fuel side is still there. So what we need to do is to have the decree also lifted off of fuel so the private sector can come in and uh, play a better role than they're able to play right now. But give me an, uh, I want to make sure I'm not wrong because we've been working on this fuel issue as to the humanitarian side of what we brought in for WHO, UNICEF, for, for operating hospitals, other facilities, uh, water, sanitation uh, plants, right. et cetera. Right. Where are we on, on for the next, we have enough fuel, I think for the next uh, 30 days, is that correct? Well, um, I, I'll have to check that number. Okay. I, I think we have sufficient fuel for the next 30 days, give or take. Then we have enough food on the ground now for the next 60 days uh, to feed the, the number of people we feed on the next 60 days. Um, Mark and I met last night. In fact, we went through the five items uh, and what Mark will be talking about. He'll talk this afternoon before I will, and uh, we agree with all – of these five items and we will complement what Mark's talking about or supplement within the context of those five items and so we believe in the context uh, that we're, we are we are hand in glove together with these requests that Mark has because I, I do think it's critical this is what the Security Council and the donors in the international community have got to, to understand we're not going to solve this problem with humanitarian aid alone and the five requests that Mark's talking about, it's a package. We need all five of those to be implemented as a package to stabilize the economy, even while the conflict goes on. Now, obviously, the best of all is the war end. Anyway, that'd be nice. Evelyn? Yes, Evelyn Leopold. Quickly, uh, the, the numbers you gave uh, out for U.S. and other contributions, is that WFP for as a whole or just Yemen? That's WFP as a whole. Right. And secondly, is there a difference in the uh, government-controlled areas as far as, as food and so forth and living standards as compared to the Houthi areas? Uh, is Saudi shoveling more aid into those areas? I don't, I don't think so. I, I might be wrong, but I think it's pretty constant across the board. Now, most of the geographical areas are controlled by where most of the people are in the Houthi areas. But I would say, it's, guys, would y'all disagree? It's pretty uniform across. Now, you obviously have pockets of folks who have more wealth in certain urban areas, but that would be anywhere in the world. But I can't – I don't think so. I think it's pretty uniform. I think everybody – I think everybody's suffering – you know what how much what areas do the houthis control it's hard to we can go i mean we, we'll we can actually map. we got yeah. the mapping yeah. we can actually show you the mapping yeah. of the areas that houthis control and we can show you the front lines mm -hmm. of how that's moving and what that does or our moving foods around because uh, th that means people didn't get moved around like four hundred thousand and how data have been displaced and how that takes place and how we have to pre-position move a lot of commodities around and and let me uh, let me touch on this just briefly because uh as i've expressed uh, very clearly uh, for since i've been in this position is that the port of hadeda is absolutely critical and regardless of of conflict that port has got to be protected it was one of the reasons that when people were shocked that i actually was going to go to hadeda uh, they you know thought that we would go to aden go to sana and and then get it, get out of town alive, right? I said, no, we're going to we're going to Hadeda. Uh, the world needs to see a UN senior official standing at that port, and letting the world know that that port has got to be protected at all costs. Uh, when I was in UAE uh, two weeks ago, I expressed these deep concerns, and the commitment that that I received from the leadership of UAE was was clear and convincing that they would do everything they can to protect the port. I had the same conversation with the Houthis, uh, both sides, so to speak, if there are two sides or 30 sides, I don't know. Uh, treat, you know, uh, This port is critical. It must be protected. We are uh, 
prepared if necessary, if all parties desire for the UN to take over the operational capacity of the port. We are prepared to do that. We do not want to do that. But if that's what it takes, we will, uh, we will do it. And I express this as well. But this port is absolutely critical. Uh, there's more that we can do at that port, we do believe. Uh, the conflict just continues to restrain, slow down, impede pro progress because Aiden is just not, doesn't have the capacity to deal with containers. Uh, what we've done in the last couple of months is that we've been talking with Oman and the Saudis about different port access points. Uh, Jazan is one of the uh, ports that we are presently assessing that uh, we can move should something happen to Hadeda as well as Oman. We've now gotten approval from Oman, the government. Now that slows down, so we're the pipeline, so we're now in the position to start putting food supply commodities through these pipelines just in case. Great. So, yeah, we have we have time for just one more question because we have another briefing right after this. Ibtizam. Uh, hi, my name is Ibtisam Azim from Al Arab Al Jadid newspaper. Uh, I, um, the first question: the the Saudi -led coalition intensified their airstrikes in the last two weeks. How do you think this impacts your operation on the ground? And the second question: which message do you have to Western countries that continue to supply, um, whether it's the Saudi -led coalition, Emiratis, and all parties with weapons? Um, thank well, you. I'll, I'll leave. I, I'm having a hard enough time dealing with the humanitarian side. I'll leave the political side up to, to the politicians. That's their role. Uh, my position is, we want to see the war come to an end. Anytime there's conflict, it always impedes access. For example, in the United Nations World Food Program, we calculate on an annualized basis. Just last year alone, one billion dollars worldwide was the increased cost of delivery of food because of conflict, whether it's South Sudan or Syria or Iraq or Yemen. Anytime there's war, anytime there's conflict, there's a substantial increase in the transport delivery of life-saving assistance. It doesn't matter who drops the bomb. It doesn't matter who pulls the trigger. Great. Uh, as you, David, thank you very much. We have a briefing by Mr. Lacroix and Mizurugi on the MONUSCO uh, situation in the Congo. So we will relieve you of your duties. Well, thank you <laughs> thank all you very, very much. much.